the gospel according to Luke the gospel according to Luke chapter 2 but at the same time we shall be reading all the gospels in order as they are written we shall be reading from the gospel of Luke chapter 2 chapter 2 and verse 1 the gospel according to Luke chapter 2 and it came to pass in those days the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was, that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day, in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled, all those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to, his, to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. 
She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow of about eighty-four years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Amen. The virgin conceived, and the virgin is about to give birth to a son. And according to the promise and the prophecy of God, this son must and will be called Jesus, which means Saviour. And it's the only face who has these two amazing names, which mean and reveal his stature, Emmanuel, which means God is with us, God upon the earth, God became flesh, and Jesus, which means Saviour of men. But things for these two people who God trusted with the birth and the upbringing of his son, problems start to increase and multiply. Two young, poor people. Mary prepared for birth. And all of a sudden, before the nine months come to pass, a unique decree comes from Caesar for all the world to be registered, the first one that happened in the human race. And many times, my brethren, what happens around us is for our own sufferings, but at the same time, and all these things God uses for His glory and our blessing. I decree, everyone must be registered. But what I want us to be careful of is that all people suffered in those times, leaving their houses by force even, because the Romans were not joking in those times. Many people suffered because they were obligated to go to the place where they were born so they can be registered. But God did not take under account the suffering, nor people's suffering, nor Joseph's suffering, nor Mary's suffering, but not even the babe which was about to come into the world. What God cares about is for His will to be done. Because He knows that His will, when it is done, even though there was suffering in the past, what will happen in the end is salvation, blessings and the glory of God. We many times, and for those who we love, but especially for ourselves, we make sure to flee sufferings and the worst things of all against the will of God. And without taking under account the work of God. Let me tell you small but very important examples. I can't be bothered to go to church today. I'm a bit sick. I've got a bit of a fever. And we find a nice excuse. Or God calls us and we don't go. Or someone else calls us for help. For us to pray for them. And we try to find a nice excuse to excuse ourselves as if God doesn't know our own hearts. He doesn't know our lives. But God, my brethren, doesn't think like that. And especially doesn't want us to think like that. A Christian doesn't flee from pain, nor does he live on easy street. A Christian is a fighter, a warrior. He's faithful to the will of God. And he knows that through many sorrows we will enter the kingdom of heaven. And it is written, and this my brethren, let's never forget it, that God isn't unjust to forget your work, especially when you do it with diligence, 
That's where God blesses. But even more so in the labor of your love. He's not unjust. And God knows how to reward. And God knows how to give. And God knows how to bless. And he himself confesses that he's not unjust to forget your work, no matter what this might be, and the labor of your love. And what I like a lot also is that the reward in heaven won't be done with the base of the gifts that you have, the ministries that you do, but it will be with a measure of everyone's labor. How tired did you get? Once God had said to a brother, Are you tired? And the brother said, Yes. Then he said to him, You must get more tired, a bit more tired. Labor, my brethren, is a blessing. Suffering is a blessing, even though for now it creates problems in our thoughts and creates problems in our lives. It's a shame to see people, and even us Christians, to labor for vain things, to tire ourselves out by working two jobs, three jobs, so we can make 300 euro more and to ignore and to be indifferent and to flee from the labor of the will of God, the work of God which God has appointed for each one of us to do. Today a mother said, let's remain here for a while. I'm very tired. I will not pray with my children today. Let the kids go to bed, they're too tired. Let them sleep. We don't have to kneel now and pray. I can't take it anymore, I'm tired. I'm very tired. When you feel, brother, very tired, glorify God about it. Because it's the grace of God that it permits for you to get tired in the work of God. Because on the other side, the devil strives to tire people out. So they can't draw near to God. And now, as at times even more wicked, it is evident now the efforts of the devil to remove people from the will and word of God. Like Moses said all of a sudden that God told me for you to come out of Egypt. You know what the Pharaoh did? His trick. He doubled the load of work on the slaves, so you won't have time to think of Moses' nonsense. But my brethren, let me tell you a nice secret. The more man gets tired in the work of God, the more God frees him from everything else, because he who is the Lord of all hosts is Christ. The devil can't do whatever he wants to do. The devil does whatever he wants to do, to the people who have removed themselves from the will of God because if a mission enters my heart, vanity and false desires, the devil will burden me with lots of things so I can succeed in them so I won't do the will of God. But if I make a steadfast decision that what I care about is the will of God, then not only the devil can't do a thing in my life, but Christ will always free me from every situation because you will be useful in the hands of Christ. And that's why, my brethren, when the Word of God confesses and reveals with all diligence, my son, protect your heart because from it spring out the issues of life. The Word of God knows what it's talking about. It's not what the devil can do. He can't do a thing to you. But he can do many things when we give him ground to walk on. When we give him ground to walk on, he can do many things because the almightiness of Christ loses his power on us. But when our decision is steadfast and immovable, whatever happens, I will remain in the will of God, then you will see what God will do. What will he do? He will do great things. Through sorrows, in this world you will have sorrows. 
but do not fear. I have overcome the world, and you will overcome the world also. And I'm happy with the people who don't take under account that they're tired when they're doing the will of God. I marvel at them, and I'm happy for them. And you know, my brethren, it's easy to do so. Because you find grace by God, God gives you rest. And you enjoy. Now things are getting difficult for Joseph and Mary. A decree. And a Roman decree. Not a joke. You will go to Bethlehem. To your own city. Where you're from. Because Joseph was from Bethlehem. From the city of David. From the tribe of Judah. Son of David. Just think now. And these journeys weren't easy. Just think now, Joseph with Mary, nine months pregnant, on a donkey, if they had a donkey, that is, but let's say they did have a donkey, because maybe they didn't. For them, to take such a journey, there were no highways, very bad roads, and to reach there, in Bethlehem, a few hours before Mary would give birth. Who would take his wife on such a journey under such circumstances? No one. No one would do this. But he could not flee from it either. And we thank God because many times God leads us to things in which we cannot flee from. But it's for great blessing. I cannot flee, but God will bless you there. He closes all the doors and you see that all of a sudden... What will I do now? God will be with you. And Joseph started off with Mary. And what impressed me is that it says in verse 5 that Mary was his betrothed wife. And I looked in the text and it doesn't say married, they were still engaged. So when it says in the Gospel of Matthew that Joseph did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, it probably means, that's what the Bible says anyway, and when the Bible says something's the truth, that they weren't even married yet. That's what I read in all the ancient writings. And that's how they've been translated. All the ancient texts. So it probably was like that. The respect. Of course, many lean on this, which you can't see anywhere else, that Mary was also from the lineage of David because she went to be registered in Bethlehem. Of course, other people say because she was a relative of Elizabeth, she was from the line of Aaron. But anyway, in the New Testament, it's not very clear. But we believe, I think, that she must be from the line of David also. Anyway, they reached there. The strange thing was that there, they did not find open doors. Sometimes we pray and say, Lord, find us a parking spot. Find us a house to live in. Joseph and Mary found nothing. What does God do? Sometimes I think that God is very, very harsh. But the truth is, my brethren, God isn't harsh. This is His will. God isn't harsh. He's good. When Lazarus reached the point of death, God didn't do it because He punished him. But through his death, resurrection would come. But if we want to find the harshest one of all, that's the father who sacrificed his own son and saw him on that cross and he turned his face from him, making him a curse. That's why I'm saying, is it harsh? Let's never be offended by Christ. Blessed is a person who is not offended by Christ. Never be offended by Christ. He's not harsh. He's good. He's full of compassion. He's love. But some things must be done like that, even though they seem to us as harsh. And so we can understand this better. We must think. Of what the Bible says, he chastens his own sons and he scourges the son in which he accepts. 
the more you suffer for the name of Jesus, the more God accepts you as His Son. And how is this explained? Because God never does more than what man can take. So if you receive a slap and you leave, He won't slap you again. And if He whips you and you leave, He won't whip you. But if He does whip you, you remain and glorify His name, He will whip you. Because through this, the glory of God will come from. Great salvation will come. The glory of heaven will be revealed. I hear that I'm very, very tired. I say to them, that's good. And I've got great sorrow and I ask for the word of God. Yes, that's very, very good then. Of course, it's easy to say these things for others, but where things get difficult, it's when it's for ourselves, for us. But glory to God, because we are human, but He is the one true God. And I didn't find a place in the inn. And I went to a place where they kept animals. It was a small village, Bethlehem. There weren't many places we put animals in. And it describes a manger, a specific place where they fed the animals. And in there, I gather they weren't alone, as people say, because now we want the truth of the gospel. Joseph was probably not the only one who didn't find a place in the inn. There were probably others with him. And you could see this because when the shepherds entered in afterward with the revelation of God to see the child, the Messiah, the Bible says, all those who heard it marveled. And others probably had not found a place in the inn and were there also. But in that place where Joseph and Mary was, so she can give birth. That's where Mary gave birth. Unbelievable. No gynecologist, no midwife, nothing but God delivered the baby. And how beautiful that babe must have been. Tell you the truth, once God has showed me this in a dream. He showed me when Jesus was just born a babe, and at the age of 12, amazing beauty. I was amazed by his beauty. Beautiful. I haven't seen such beauty before. And the beauty was the brightness and the whiteness. Glory to God. And there he was born. And they wrapped him in swaddling cloths in a manger. Where the cows ate from, the donkeys ate from, the sheep ate from. Now I can't say that she would have been happy in there. Because then Joseph and Mary are people like us, humans. They must have been tired, burdened in these surroundings, in foreigners, strange people, for Mary to give birth, for her to breastfeed. Here we have different rooms for the sisters to breastfeed in. There's a difficult situation to live in, but my brethren, we thank God because God knows how to comfort people. God knows how to comfort people truly. He knows how to edify them. He finds ways. He doesn't let them drown from exaggerated sorrow. God doesn't permit this. Of course, he permits sorrows, but he comes and takes sorrows away because he died for our sorrows and our problems and our sicknesses. And even though they were there at night, she'd just given birth. She was hurting under ugly conditions. And Joseph, what could he do for her? Just given birth, a wounded woman after a birth with pain. And all of a sudden, shepherds enter. What nice comfort. Where is he? Where is he? They said. Who? The child who's in the manger. 
And they turned around and saw him. And they started to confess. What a nice consolation when a prophecy comes, a confession comes that God is with you. There's no nicer consolation for you to be disappointed, for you to be in despair, in trouble, and for God to find a way to say, I will bless you, I am with you. I love you. You see what I will do. And for people to tell you this who are strangers to you, not someone who loves you, but someone who doesn't know you, doesn't even know you. And the shepherds entered the stable and said, You know what happened to us? Everyone was listening. They all marveled. And how nice now God introduces. He introduces Joseph and Mary to the others. The babe. We were keeping our sheep, our animals. And all of a sudden an angel was revealed to us. Bright and shining. And he said to us, Do not be afraid. For behold, I will bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day, and I like this word, for there is born, it has happened, because what Christ prophesies, we wait for it to happen. But some point comes when it has happened. He has been born has been born, a saviour has been born, in the city of David. And this child has two characteristics. He is the Christ, anointed by the Lord, and this child is the Lord. The Lord has been born. Hallelujah. Many times, I have wondered, how do I see you, Lord? Do I see you as a saviour? That's good. Do I see you as my doctor? That's good. Do I see you as my God? That's good. But my brethren, we must necessarily, but we must necessarily confess him as our Lord. You see, Thomas, when he acknowledged when Christ's resurrection was revealed to him, he cried out, My Lord and my God. And you know what Lord means? Automatically, that moment when you acknowledge Him as your Lord, you confess obedience, submission, servantship, but in the complete freedom of the Holy Spirit. It's not the little Christ. It's not the little God. The manger, the horses. He is the Lord of Lords. The King of Kings. He is the Master of the Universe. It is He who has been given the Most High Name, in which every knee will bow before. Every knee will bow. And my brethren, be careful of this. Not all human knees, but all the knees in heaven, on earth and under earth will bow to Him. Everyone will worship before Him, and all will confess that He is the Lord of all. And he is this babe now. And he is my brethren, the word of God. And he is our saviour and our redeemer. Now we'll add something. And he is our friend. Who offers us abundantly his friendship, his love. He's the most trustworthy face. No other person is even worthy talking about. We can't trust anyone else. With the meaning of hope. Only Jesus Christ. Only the one true God. Christ the Lord. He was born. And all the angels, a multitude of angels gathered and cried out, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace came, because Christ is the Prince of Peace. Without Christ there's no peace. Without Christ there's no peace, nor in the hearts of men, nor in the lives of men, nor in the families of men, nor 
in the Church of Christ, nor in our relatives. No peace at all. Only Christ can bring and offer true peace. Peace which is the result of love, the result of truth, and the characteristic of happiness. Two things are described in the Word of God as happiness of man. The first thing is, is peace, and the second is prosperity. Prosperity in spiritual things and prosperity everywhere. These are the characteristics of happiness of man. And goodwill toward men. With the birth of Christ, therefore, God is glorified. Peace comes on earth. And goodwill, God's goodwill, the grace of God in the lives of men. Let's not forget this. When you call out the name of Jesus, all three things take place. God is glorified. Because God is glorified with the salvation of men, and men are saved when they call upon the name of Jesus. Man has lots of fruit. He confesses the name of Jesus, and many are saved for the glory of God the Father. With salvation, peace comes. When you talk about Christ, you are full of peace and joy and happiness, the presence of God. But, and when Christ is born in our lives, or Christ comes in our lives, because whoever cries out to him, Christ comes. Whoever seeks Christ will find him. He will find Christ for sure. He will. Whoever cries out to Christ will find him. And the third characteristic is goodwill toward man. The blessings of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God in our lives. They all marveled. Joseph and Mary marveled, and the people who heard all these things, but not only did they marvel, but they were also comforted in their loneliness, in their desolation, in their sufferings. God came in a nice way to comfort them and assure them that I am with you. I am with you. Now, from now on, Joseph and Mary must do the will of God. And we have said that God trusted these two people for many reasons. One reason is because of their upright heart. And the second basic reason is because of their obedience so much in the word of God and to the voice of the Holy Spirit, no matter where it's coming from. The eighth day came. They have to go to the temple now. They have to circumcise the child as the law said. And I like this because it's not only that they left from Nazareth and they reached Bethlehem and Jerusalem and will see further down with the command, the decree of Caesar, but from now on they have the chance to execute everything according to the will of God. Why? Because where the Lord takes you even by force, there he will give you the chance to do all the will of God. There he will give you the chance to do so. The eighth day, circumcision took place. And on the fortieth day, according to the law of Moses, the purification of Mary took place. As the law said, the mother had to be purified. But especially for the males, to dedicate them to the Lord, the firstborn. Everything is ready, my brethren. Beloved, the plan of God is amazing. Everything is ready. From the beginning, prophesied and everything prepared. Jesus must be dedicated to the Lord. It is He who 1500 BC, Moses had written for the birth that God said to the serpent, The seed of the woman will crush your head. And the woman obtained the seed once, and that was the virgin. Everything's ready. 
everything's true. Forty days went by, you know. No matter how much the Lord comforts us, if our suffering continues, we fall into sorrow again. And God must renew His comfort in our lives. And we thank God for that. Because God does do this. He renews His comfort in men who are found in sorrow because of His name. He renews it. Now 40 days have gone by. Joseph has forgotten a lot of things. But to say the truth, he hasn't forgotten them, but they have burnt out. The comfort has burnt out. Sorrow came back again. The sorrow of loneliness, desolation. But God has more consolation. They're not rich people to offer lamb as a sacrifice, as the command was of Moses. They were poor children. And I'd like to point this out. Poor children, but they had Christ with them. Hallelujah. They were in the will of God. And the Bible says, If your beginning is small, your end will be great and blessed. That's why I want to see a young couple, and one loves the other, and they haven't got money. I say to myself, God will bless them a lot. If we do get married, how are we going to live afterwards? God has foreseen. God will take care. What will He do? The best things that come with your salvation. Doesn't He say so? Poor children. But they did the will of God. God trusted them. Now I will say something which many people might not like. But I've seen that God trusts the poor more. The more humble. Maybe. Not that he doesn't love the rich people either, he does take care of them, but God does something more with the poor. He shows compassions to the weak man and he trusts him. And I think that a poor man is humble, because he has to be because of his situation. Of course pride might come in any situation, but he trusts the poor. I have to say something else which God put in my heart. And I say it with assurance. He also loves the foreigners. You know, Joseph and Mary are foreigners here, but God is with them. Let's take care of foreigners, my brethren. Let's love them. Especially when God is with them, not when they're in the mafia, of course. If they're in the mafia, protect yourself. But... This moment, Mary and Joseph are a young couple, poor couple, and foreigners. Let's see what God does now. They're going to offer, according to the word of God, obedient to the will of God completely, to offer his firstborn son to God, and Mary for her purification. But God has other things in his mind. There's a holy man there of God, just, devout, who read the scriptures and was waiting the coming of the Messiah. My brethren, are we waiting for the coming of the Messiah? Are we waiting for Jesus Christ? Simeon was, and he was a just man. And for our times, I would say, justified with the blood of Jesus Christ. A godly man, a devout man. He loved God. He prayed. And God liked Simeon and chose him. He said to him, come here. Are you just? I see that you are. Are you godly? I see that you are. You're waiting for the Messiah because you read the scriptures. You will see him. Let me say it again. Are you just? Are you devout? Do you read the scriptures and are you waiting for the Messiah to come? You'll see him. How nice. You'll see him. And I will not permit you to die until you take him in your arms. Dear Lord, make us like that. For us to be just, godly, 
for us to wait for Jesus Christ to come. Not now so we could take him in our arms, but so he can take us in his arms and take us to heaven. You won't die. I promise you, God said, with the revelation of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, I promise you that you will not leave from this life until your eyes see your Saviour. Who I have prepared for all peoples nice revelations. Peter didn't have the revelation even. He thought that Christ was only for the Israelites. But Simeon had this revelation that this Saviour will be for all peoples. I like to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And the years did go by. And the Messiah was late in coming and Simon was getting much, much older. But what does God do? And the years did go by, but Simon was waiting. He was sure. God had said to me that I will not die until my eyes see the Messiah. And at one point in time in his old age, Simeon, led by the Spirit, went to the temple. And there he sees two young children, poor foreigners, with a child in their hands, offering it to the Lord. It's a nice thing that we dedicate our children to Christ. A nice thing. And this happens only in the church. In the Old Testament, it was only for the firstborn males. But the church of Christ is the church of firstborn. Girls and boys. And so we dedicate them more to Christ and firstly ourselves. And once he took the babe in his arms, the Holy Spirit came and said to him, that's who I was talking about. Look at him well. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit, Simeon. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. I'm leaving the earth now because you told me so and my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. I like to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. But I said these things. Joseph and Mary heard. What nice comfort. What nice edification again. The first day was a birth and 40 days after. So, the consolation and joy can be preserved in the life of man. My brethren, we need injections of comfort. We need injections of love. But, let me say something which is nicer and better. We need to inject Injections of comfort in others, and injections of love into others, and injections of comfort and edification and prayers. Comfort one another. How nice. Hold other people's burdens. What nice commands. No one else has said these words. These words have not been heard by human ears. Only the Gospel of Christ says these things. Only Christ has said these things. Hold other people's burdens. You who are strong, hold the infirmities of the weak. One submitting to the other, putting on humility. What nice words. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. My brethren, the Word of God changes the thoughts of men. You know why? Because the Word of God is light. And people are in darkness. When the light comes, it changes everything, everything. It changes anxieties, despair. It changes ignorance. It changes everything. But it says something else to Mary. 
a prophecy now. Wait and see. Firstly, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Many because of him will fall, and many because of him will be resurrected. Those who will accept him will be resurrected. Those who will reject him will fall. A son which will be spoken against. Truly, my brethren, Christ is a son which many go against. And even a Christian in his surroundings, he's a sign which will be spoken against. One person will say he's a good man, another person will say he's a fool. Someone else will call him a liar, a heretic. Someone else will call him blessed. They say whatever they want to say. But you should know, my brother, that in your surroundings, when you've got Christ and you live for Christ, you will be a sign which will be spoken against. You will hear the woes. You won't hear many, well done. A Christian doesn't hear well done. He'll just hear one in the end, well done, good and faithful servant. Here, you won't hear any bravos. Bravo, you're very good. You never hear such things. You're a very good Christian, bravo. You become a Christian, bravo. You never hear that. They just shake their heads when you talk to them about Christ. Except for the people that God has pre-appointed for eternal life. And for you, Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul when you see him on the cross. A sword will pierce through your own soul. But you also will see him risen and you will also receive the Holy Spirit and you will be happy for the honor that God gave you. And even though all these things happened, now Anna the prophetess, 84 years old, a widow from a very young age. She was married for seven years. She was a widow for at least 60 years. But I like what it says here. This woman did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. What a woman this was. Glory to God. Let's be careful of this. This woman is smaller than the smallest in the kingdom of heaven. Because to us, everything is done by grace. But when we have the grace and the freedom of the Holy Spirit and we enslave ourselves to the Word of God, then great things the Almighty will do in our lives. Great things. And Hannah the prophet is started to prophesy, saying that this is the Messiah. And to all, she said that God gave grace and sent Jesus Christ. From now on, Things won't get better for Joseph and Mary. They will now find a house to live in. And all of a sudden, the three wise men will come from the east and bring them a treasure, gifts. They will say that Christ is born, the Messiah is born, Herod will get angry. With a cunning way, he will try to kill Jesus, but Joseph, faithful to the word of God, took the treasures that God gave him, everything ready. He was found in Egypt. He waited there. And when the fulfillment of time came, God said to him, go back. And he went to Nazareth because the will of God is that the child to be called a Nazarene. Finishing, my brethren, we must point out one more time, everything is ready. Everything is planned by God. But not everyone is walking in the plan of God. And though people of God pray and say, like Moses, David, Peter, Paul, God, teach me the way in which I must walk on. Teach me to do your will. Teach me to persevere until the end so I will be saved. Amen. Hallelujah.